said, and what has happened to our truth? Does truth exist? With a capital T. How do we shape our truth? Or are we limited by our perceptions? Well, how do we understand the world? Well, we understand the world through our senses, but can we actually trust them? So, what do you see? Are you sure? Look a little closer. Two people. Two? Just two? Two people. not a frog, but we were tricked, weren't we? What colour is this dress? can do it. But who is correct? Well, everyone. So what it has to do with is how our brain processes light, and that actually we all correct, but we can't really trust what we see. What about what we read? Being an English literature teacher, I had to bring in my favorite novel. And before I talk about it, novels are important because we like characters, because the author wanted us to like the character. <coughs> characters are constructed. So I want to talk about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. And I'm interested in when Frankenstein, we follow Frankenstein's narrative for the first five chapters, and then the creature or his monster awakens, and we hear his perspective on it. And he uses terrible language like it was a catastrophe. He calls his monster a wretch. He calls his skin yellow and it barely covered his muscles. And his eyes are done white sockets. And he has a shriveled complexion. So we start thinking that he is a monster. However, <coughs> later on in the novel, Shelley switches perspective to the creature. And we find out the creature's perspective of the moment he awakes. And he uses such beautiful and articulate language. Things like he says, it is with considerable difficulty that I remember the, orig the original error of my being. And he says things, a strange, multipl uh, sorry, a strange multiplicity of sensation sees me. So really beautiful and sophisticated. And he was darkness surrounded him, he felt troubled, and then he sat down and wept. So once again, our, our sympathy changes. And by this stage of the story, we are more concerned about the creature than Dr. Frankenstein. But it's a novel. We know it's not meant to be true. It's a piece of fiction. So I want to ask you, what about all this information? We live in an age where we actually have all the answers at our fingertips. So what happens if I want to find out the capital of Mozambique, country in Africa? I put it into Google and I get a lot of information. I find out, it's Mobutu. I find out more information about the country. I get a little uh, clip um, and information about the capital. <coughs> what about if I want to change a tire? Put that in. And I even get three different YouTube videos demonstrating how to do it. So we have all this information, but is it reliable? Can I believe it? So there's a term floating around that has been, made, has been made very popular by Donald Trump, and that is fake news. <laughs> Does it exist? Well, how can I tell you something's a little bit fake, or partially fake, or 100% fake, or fake for satirical purposes? So fake news does exist, 
And it's sometimes really difficult to tell if something is fake or not. And that is because it's meant to resemble credible journalism and it is meant to circulate around social media and with, with adv advertising, so it generates money. Let's have a look at some articles and see if we can figure it out. Right, human meat found in McDonald's meat factory farm. So it looks like a credible uh, template, however, how do I know it's not? Well, I would say the big picture of those human ribs could actually maybe, it, it produces fear. So we immediately start questioning the validity and we think, oh no, maybe I shouldn't eat at McDonald's. What about a, a site called Daily USA Info? Well, it's information, so maybe it's correct. It mimics credible news sites saying breaking, Hillary Clinton personally funded Antifa terrorists. Well, we've seen breaking so many times in the news. Maybe it is true. But I would like to talk about the, the, the very tragic Las Vegas shooting. And there was a lot of miscommunication and misinformation floating around, to the point that uh, the wrong perpetrators were identified. So pictures like this were circulating around, and even, even mainstream media picked up on it. And it took, once they arrested the correct person, it took so long for the information, the correct information, to catch up. Even victims were, um, were, uh, were floating around. And my concern, well, I think one encouraging thing is that I found this article on BBC Online, and they said, uh, they reached out to these people and said, well, why are you doing this? Why are you spreading misinformation? And unsurprisingly, they did not respond. But now, what could happen with all this information moving around? Well, my concern is vigilante behavior. And a very good example of this is a post-Charlottesville, Virginia suprem white supremacist rallies. Uh, civil rights activists really wanted to name and shame the people that took place. So they started circulating pictures. And people started trying to make links and trying to identify who could be who. And this poor professor was accused of being at this rally. He had to go into hiding for a few days, and it took much longer for the correct information to come out. So just quickly, before we carry on, what should you watch for? Always be careful of articles that promote fear, because fear makes you overlook facts, and it's, it's, a, it's a reaction that makes you feel threatened. So you ignore everything else. Check the writing style. Ask yourself, is it clear? Is it coherent? Does it abide by grammatical rules? If the answer is no, I think you know your answer. Um, the blame game. Watch out when there's one person that you have to put all your anger on because then you ignore facts. Also, watch out for generalizations because they are blanket terms hiding the lack of fact. And always check your source. Right, so that's fake news. But what about reputable news sites? They are meant to keep their audience interested, but how do they do this and still deliver accurate news? So, the last US election um, exposed a lot of misinformation and a lot of what, the way information was traveling. Now, in a pre-election rally, there was, uh, Donald Trump was accused of mocking a disabled reporter. Let's watch. Donald Trump facing new criticism for something he did on the campaign trail last night in South Carolina while defending his debunked claim that he saw thousands of Muslims celebrate the collapse of the Twin Towers here in New York. He appeared to mock a reporter with a disability. Take a look. Written by a nice reporter. Now the poor guy, you gotta see this guy. Oh, I don't know what I said. Oh, I don't remember. He's going like, I don't remember. I go, oh, maybe that's what I said. This is 14 years ago. He still, they didn't do a retraction. That reporter he is talking about is Serge Kovaleski, who now works for the New York Times. As you can see right there, he suffers from a chronic condition that impairs movement of his arms. 
A Thai spokesman says they find it outrageous that Trump would ridicule the man's appearance. Right, so did Trump mock the reporter? I believed he did, because my reputable news sites told me that he did. But he claimed he did not do it intentionally. So after chatting to a friend who encouraged me to consider other sources, um, I thought was re what was really interesting is that the pro-Trump sites said that this is actually his default gesture he uses when he doesn't agree with, with the person. So maybe it was intentional, maybe it wasn't. I will never know, but what I learned from that is to explore sources. But uh, politics is always up for debate. What about science? Does the media get it right? So in July 2016, there was a trial that was done and newspapers in the UK reported on it. They said this was a miracle drug. It was gonna halt Alzheimer's, even reverse some of the effects. However, across the Atlantic in the States, they said things like it was and it was, it was faltering. The trial was a flop. There was no truth to it. But who was correct? Well, actually, the states were correct. And Alzheimer's UK have said that the, maybe one of the reasons that the newspapers focused on positive elements is that in the trial, there was a very small number that showed promise, but too small to make a solid conclusion. But what about that debate? There's always the debate. What diet, sorry, the diet. Which debate, which diet should you follow? Do you do low fat or low carbohydrate? So another uh, scientific uh, study was done and published in a journal, and two new science picked up on it. And one said, low fat is the way. The next one said, no, no, low carb is the way. They were reporting on the same trial. So I thought we'd I'd have a look into it. But the problem is, I am an English teacher, I wrote my husband into helping me, and the more we looked at the original study, the more we realized the study was too small, there were 19 people, it was too short, six days, and the way they measured fat didn't really make sense, even for me. So actually, this was not even newsworthy, but it must have been a slow news day. So, to sum up, if you can remember, please, no information is neutral. Always reflect on the, the material, even if it is from your usual, reputable source, and consider who is posting it. Be careful of articles promoting fear, be vigilant, and keep asking questions. So, what has happened to our truth? Well, I think if I've proved anything, our truth is actually being reported by someone else with their perceptions and their interpretations. And I hope you keep that in mind. And finally, I'd like to leave you with this quotation. The science of psychology has taught us, human beings are not by nature, a fact-driven, rational beings we like to think we are, we get the facts wrong more often than we think we do, and we do so in predictable ways. We engage in wishful thinking, we embrace information that supports our beliefs and rejects, reject evidence that challenges them. Thank you.